Hello, everybody. This should be recording. I hope it is. I think it is. Okay, so welcome to Orgo Lecture 5. Um, for some of your, uh, from some, for some of you guys, I was able to get all the way down to uh, mass spectroscopies. For some of you, I really didn't even get to enter into the ultraviolet. And so I decided I'm going to make a recording just to make sure that we can get this information in before we start next week. So I'm going to be posting this today. Today's uh, still Friday. Um, <clears throat> Tomorrow, I'm going to be posting the, um, the, the lab techniques for the biochemistry portion of your MCAT. And then on Saturday, I'm going to be posting the chapter seven of ORGO uh, uh, online as, re as a recorded lecture. And then on, on Monday, we're going to be finishing chapter six of ORGO. And with all of that done, we're going to have every single concept of the, of the, uh, of the ORGO part portion of your MCAT completely done. So people find Orgo to be intimidating. I just want to present it in a fun manner. That's how I try to structure my, my, my classes. And uh, with biochemistry, since most of us are bio majors, we should have a fundamental understanding of most of the, of most of the stuff, like enzymes and inhibition. But you know, some, of things, some of those things are really high yield. So that's what we're going to be going over uh, next week. We're going to be going over not everything in biochemistry. We're going to be going over the high yield topics of biochemistry. And as we approach the, the, the semester, we're going to be finding those niche, quite like those niche low yield questions, and then we'll be talking about those during the review on um, on Saturdays. But okay, so everyone heard about my my uh, my first slide or my second slide, hydrogen bonding. So I have to go over that one. We can uh, also just re uh, reiterate the 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 mechanism of spectroscopy. So what spectroscopy is all about is the 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 shooting of a photon from a specific area of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have different areas, right? We have the, the light area, we have the infrared region, we have the gamma region. If we were to shoot a compound with a, you know, let's say for example, light, we're able to derive a property or a piece of information from that compound with that specific uh, uh, electromagnetic wave region. So for example, if we were to shoot a compound with lights, with visible light, the information that we're going to get from that compound is color. Right, like we're always viewing color, that's a type of spectroscopy, that's data we're collecting from our environment. Um, another thing that we can uh, use for um, deriving information is for example, uh, infrared light, ultraviolet light. So there's different um, light sources. If we were to shoot at a compound, we can derive different information. Okay, so just to um, present it in a way that might um, be better to visualize, Let's say we have a you know any any of the the the, the regions like the visible light region or the infrared region. Let's say like this is the the range of that region. Well, within the range of that region, there's going to be this wavelength, this wavelength, this wavelength, all of these wavelengths. Right? Let's say like it's visible light. Visible light has a bunch of wavelengths. Like red is 700, violet is like 400, and then we have all the like orange, yellow, blue. They're all in between in this here spectrum. So we're going to remember that we even talked about ground state and the excited state that the photon in which the electron on the ground state is going to use to bump up into the excited state is going to be quantized. So what does that mean? What that means is that it has to be a specific uh, energy level, right? It has to be specifically 100 uh, energy units, for example, just to say some arbitrary unit. It can't be 99, it can't be 101, it has to be 100. So that very specific, um, what's it called, energy is, uh, that is absorbed by the ground state electron and then e eventually shot out by the higher energy electron when it goes back down to the ground state and it shoots it out as a photon. That specific energy level is, you know, is associated with a wavelength, right? So when this energy goes down to the ground state, it's going to uh, release that energy that it took from going from this high energy state to its ground state. It's going to release that energy as a photon that photon is going to be used to derive data about that compound. So just to, just to reiterate, like let's say that this dash right here is the one that is absorbed by this electron, then okay, that's cool for that compound or for that bond or whatever it is we're looking at, but it's not going to absorb any of these other ones, right? It's very specific to this right here, energy level, this wavelength. Just remember the relationship, the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency or the, uh, the lower the frequency, the, the lower the energy level, just remember that, that relationship. So this, okay, <laughs> I know I said it a couple of times, but yeah, just, it's really important. Um, the reason why it's important is because it helps us discriminate a lot of things. It makes things very unique and it's very specific. And that's why we can derive a lot of information because if everything was broad and, and kind of 
mixed together, then we, it would be really like uh, um, ambiguous what kind of information both that we get. But because of this right here, this um, this quantized uh, you know order, we're able to get really good information. But okay, so let's go into ultraviolet slash visible spectroscopy, also known as UV vis. So what you need to know first is okay the ranges of ultraviolet as well as visible light. So here I have this circle, but uh, another way to, to remember like this, rather than memorizing like this circle, like this wheel, you can just remember the acronym Roy G. Biv. So it's Roy, like the boy, and G. Biv. I'm not gonna be making more jokes so that joke sucked. All right, so <clears throat> we have Roy G. Biv, right? And it's very important that it's in this order because it tells you, uh, you know, first color order and also tells you decreasing wavelength. So red is going to actually have the highest wavelength at 700 nanometers and violet is going to have the lowest wavelength at 400 nanometers. So what does this tell us? Well, basically this tells us that red has a higher wavelength than an example violet. And because it has a higher wavelength, remember that relationship, if it has a higher wavelength, that means it has a lower frequency. That means it has less energy. So that means like let's say if we were to you know be given a choice like hey would you rather have red light shine in your eyes or violet light well then you're gonna have to tell them hey red light why because it has less energy maybe the energy is not appreciable to actually make a difference whether it's going to hurt you or not but just note that the violet light has more energy why because it has a smaller wavelength okay so where would ultraviolet light be in this you know in this region like would it be over here would it be over there well let's look at the name it's ultraviolet light, right? So violet is not up top here, it's actually down here and it's ultraviolet. So it's gonna be beyond the violet, it's gonna be lower than violet. If the region of ultraviolet light is less than violet, that means that its wavelength is less than 400 nanometers. And if its wavelength is less than 100, uh, 400 nanometers, that means it has more energy uh, than, than violet. So the ultraviolet region has higher energy photons or has higher energy region than visible light. Okay, so now that we have all that all that down packed, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes I like randomly need to like sneeze. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, here ultraviolet light that's lower than violet light, which means it has higher energy, a lower wavelength. Okay, so what can we do with ultraviolet um, slash visible spectroscopy UV vis? Well, uh, in UV vis, we can do one of two things. So either we can uh, find information on transition metals. So we would shoot uh, UV vis at transition metals. The electrons in the transition and the transition metals are really uh, able to just jump around because they are in the d orbitals. Like usually, we're working with uh, with p orbitals or s orbitals and d orbitals. So there's like five of them, and the p orbitals there's three of them, and s orbitals there's only one. The d orbitals, the electrons can really move around. And so when we shoot them with this, you know, let's say violet, uh, ultraviolet light, which is high energy or like visible light, then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving the electrons around. And when the electrons go back into the ground state, the compound that we're shooting the, the, uh, the light at is going to shoot a photon back out and we're able to derive information about our transition metal. So that's the reason why our transition metals just really have these, these, these bright colors like gold and copper, like and silver, like think of those colors. The reason why we can, the reason why they have those bright colors transition modes is because they're able to absorb uh, these, these, these spectra and shoot back a photon that is really bright. Like it's, it's got really bright um, uh, uh, photons and, and the colors are, are really great. So, I mean, what you need to know about transition metals is that they are able to absorb UV this. And that's all about that you need to know. It was like one paragraph on it in the TPR book. I tried to look it up online. There's not too much on it. So, I mean, this is like kind of yield, low yield stuff. The higher yield stuff for UV vis, the thing that you're going to be really be asked about is the second thing, which is the conjugated organic compounds. Okay, so what, um, you know, what are we going to be using UV vis for conjugated organic compounds? Well, just to remember like the concept of conjugated organic compounds, what they are is conjugated systems in which we have at least two, uh, three um, p orbitals in parallel and electrons are able to move from those orbitals and actually hop onto different atoms. So if you remember like this electron just go from this one to this one, 
this electron can also move from here to there. It's a conjugated system. The electrons are delocalized over these three uh, atoms. And just remember a, a, an sp hybrid, like an sp3 hybridized orbital, it doesn't allow those electrons to move around. They're just stuck there. They're localized. But because of a conjugated system, we're allowed to have these electrons move around. That's kind of like similar to the transition modes, right? The electrons are moving around, is doing their thing. All right. So what can UVVIS tell us about conjugated systems, right? Well, what it tells us is how conjugated our compound is. Okay, so how can we you know, tell? Well, the higher or the more conjugated your system, the higher the absorbance wavelength that your, uh, your compound is going to absorb will be. So just to reiterate, the more conjugation, the higher the wavelength that is absorbed. So if we have something that's super, super conjugated, then it's going to be most likely going to be absorbing, you know, red rather than blue, right? Because it has, it's going to be absorbing higher wavelength, right? So let's give an example, All right? So just remember conjugated, uh, highly conjugated means going, it's going to be absorbing higher wavelength, lower conjugated means that it's going to be absorbing a, uh, a lower wavelength. So high conjugated, high wavelength, low conjugated, low wavelength, okay? That's going to be a common thing. I'm going to like, restate things as I like try to find my notes. All right, so let's say, and you guys just remember that this is my benzene right here. So don't get offended if I just do a bunch of like benzenes that look complete garbage. I'm just, I'm not really good at, at drawing hexanes or cyclohexanes. So, <clears throat> so this is one compound. Let's call this one compound A. And let's call this one over here, compound B. Right, those are conjugated systems. All these benzenes are attached to each other. Um, and so we're going to have uh, A and B. And A has this conjugated system of like three rings and B has a conjugated system of five rings. So if we were to use the information that we've just get, like with, that we've just learned that the more conjugation that you have, the higher the wavelength you absorb. Well, then what that means is that B, molecule B, will actually be absorbing a a wavelength that is higher than A. Why? Because it has more conjugation. So B would most likely absorb in this region, and then A would be most likely to absorb in this region. Why? Because it's a lower wavelength because it has a lower conjugation. So these, you know, these molecules actually have like proper absorbance and like it's quantified. So I'm going to just show you to them now so you can see the actual difference, right? So compound A, there's like three uh, benzene system is actually going to absorb UV light at 360, oh, that's a three, 363 uh, nanometers, or the wavelength equals 363. Okay, so remember, we talked about how UV light, the range is lower than visible light. Okay, so it's, it's a pretty small wavelength. And B, on the other hand, it just has two additional benzene. So as I have a higher conjugation, uh, as, as more conjugated, as more uh, P orbitals, involving in delocalized electrons. This here, uh, five benzene structure is always is actually going to absorb the light of 595 nanometers. So as we can see, the um, this conjugated system, it being more conjugated, is going to absorb a higher wavelength than this conjugated system over here. Okay. So we talked about how, uh, so this is something they might've learned like, I don't know, like randomly in elementary school or whatever. But um, it's important to note that whenever you absorb something, that means that you're showing something, right? So like if you, you, know, if you look at, for example, a orange, the, 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 the uh, fruit orange is actually not, uh, is not uh, what's it called, absorbing, excuse me, it's not absorbing orange light, it's actually reflecting orange light. It's, it's kind of pretty much, uh, absorbing everything else except for orange, right? Orange is what it's shown because it's not absorbing orange. So how can we determine, you know, whether something is absorbing or, or, or appearing as something or reflecting as something? Well, we can just use this principle that uh, if you're absorbing red, for example, then you go across this, this color circle and the opposite color is going to be what you're appearing as. So although these uh, systems right here, this conjugated system is absorbing UV light at 360, uh, 363 nanometers, the, the color that it's actually going to appear as is slightly white light because white light, it comes right before the visible light. 
And then this conjugated system here, B, is going to be absorbing 595 nanometers. However, it's going to be appearing as blue, right? So it's absorbing yellow and appearing as blue. As we can tell from here, this principle of absorbing versus, uh, versus appearing as. Well, let's see, like this yellow is right here. Remember, uh, 595 is around yellow. And it's going to be absorbing, like it's not perfect, like the, the, the line, but it's going to be absorbing in the blue range, right? Okay, so like instead of memorizing the circle, all you have to do is kind of take your acronym RoyGBiv and try to make the best circle that you possibly can um, that is like nice and spaced out. So Roy G Biv. And let's say we shoot, uh, we, the, we're absorbing red. And so you're going to be uh, appearing as green. And that's true, right? We have red over here. We have green over here on the opposite side. And yellow, we have violet and blue. We have uh, orange. So just try to make the best Roy G. Biv circle that you can, something similar to this. And then you can, you know, you can use that if it pops up on an exam, for, an, for example. Like, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it pop up on an exam. Like, okay, you're absorbing red. We're just going to be your, your, your other color. You're most likely just going to just remember Roy G. Biv and just think, okay, if it's red, just draw a circle. And then it's going to be appearing as this color. That would be the extent to which uh, they will, might ask that, that question. Okay. So what is the uh, mechanism behind UV vis, right? Just to go over that. So why is it that when you have a higher conjugated system, you're absorbing wavelength, wavelength, um, why are you absorbing a higher wavelength and, rather than a lower wavelength? Well, let's look at the concept of homo and lumo that we talked about in orgo when Boykis or Roth was around, right? When we had those guys for, for, our, for our teachers back in the good old days. So the concept of homo, let's just say this is energy. The concept of homo and lumo is that homo is the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. Molecular orbital. Remember, orbitals, they're occupied by electrons, right? So let's just say this is our homo right here, right? Just like this energy level. So the highest occupied. So like, there's no other electrons beyond this orbital. And then we have lumo, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So because it's unoccupied, it's always going to be higher than HOMO. However, it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be the next thing over. Like, so let's say you're all like, you know, there's a building and, you know, the fourth floor, and it has like five floors, right? And they say that there's only residents at the fourth floor. Well, the fifth floor would be LUMO, right? It's the thing that's unoccupied and it's higher in energy, right? The, the fifth floor is higher than the fourth floor. And yes, I just made up that analogy right now. Keep in the G. So if you have, oh God, I got to show up. All right, so if you have HOMO here and you have LUMO here, well, the energy difference between HOMO and LUMO can be drawn with this arrow, right? This is an energy difference. So where we have we heard energy difference before? Oh, it's when we talked about it when we were in this uh, slide. We talked about that specific uh, photon that is absorbed. Well, okay, check it out. So if this is uh, HOMO and LUMO, and this is the difference in energy between them. Well, this difference in energy between these, the, the lowest um, unoccupied molecular orbit and the highest occupied molecular orbital is going to tell you what type of photon this system is going to be absorbing, right? So if this, like, let's say this is your size of energy and you take that energy and you like, you do some math to it and you convert it into wavelength, you can actually determine what kind of wave you're going to be absorbing, right? But you don't have to do all that for the MCAT. You just have to know the concept of homo and lumo, and the difference between them is going to be the energy in which the, your your uh, your system is going to be absorbing. Okay, so how does this deal with conjugation, right? So if we have a conjugated system, remember conjugation allows the delocalization of electrons, and the more your 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 kind of charge is dissipated throughout your molecule, the more stable your molecule is going to be. So if we have a highly conjugated system. Well, what's going to happen is that the difference in energy between your homo and lumo is going to decrease, right? So let's say we have a different version, right? A different graph right here, and this is energy. Let's say your homo is over here, so let's just say H, and your lumo is right here. Well, this distance right here between this one and this one, the, the distance is vast, right? This was a bigger distance, and this one is a smaller distance. The photon that is going to be absorbed here is pretty small, right? Well, what does that mean? Remember how we talked about the higher conjugated system is going to be absorbing higher wavelength? 
Well, if this right here, the difference between homo and lumo on this one, like you see how this energy is very small. Remember how we talked about how if it has low energy, it has low frequency, meaning it has high wavelength. Okay, now things are starting to come together, right? So if the more conjugated system you have, the, the lower the energy that you're going to be absorbing. And remember, low energy means high wavelength, right? So if we were to assign, and remember we have like molecule A, molecule B here. If we were to assign these two to these two charts, well, which one would it be applying to which? So in this case, the homo and lumo, and let's just say chart one and chart two. In chart one, we have a high energy difference between lumo and homo. Remember, high energy equals high frequency. And what's the inversion of frequency? Wavelength. So that means you're gonna have a low wavelength, right? So for this system, yeah, you're going to have you're going to need a photon with a lot of energy, and if a photon has a lot of energy, it means it's going to have a low wavelength. For this system, you're not going to require that much energy, so that means you're going to have a a a higher wavelength that's going to be absorbed. Remember, low energy means high wavelength. High energy means low wavelength. So for chart, I'm not sure if I if I said that wrong before, so I'm just going to reiterate. Here in chart one we have homo and lumo, and this energy is at this level. It's higher than the energy needed for this homo and lumo in chart two, which means that this energy is going to be having a lower wavelength. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I said that before correctly, so I'm just trying to like make sure I say it properly. So remember, if we have a high energy over here, that means we're going to be requiring a low wavelength. If we have a low wavelength for chart two, that means we're going to be requiring a high wavelength. Okay, <laughs> I keep forgetting what I say, and I'm not sure if I said the right thing because like sometimes I jumble it up. So I'm gonna say it for a third time. So bear with me because I just want to make sure I have it right. Okay, so guys, if you were taking notes before, like, oh man, which one is the right one? This is the right one. I'm not sure why I'm like, um, maybe because it's like 9 p.m. and I've been like teaching since eight in the morning. So okay, ready? All right. Chart one has a lot of energy. Yeah, let me just draw it out so I can be consistent. Chart one, a lot of energy. If it has a lot of energy, remember the relationship. If it has a lot of energy, it's going to have a low wavelength. Here, we don't have that much energy, which means that we're going to have a higher wavelength. Okay, so between molecules A and molecules B, which one would be assigned to chart one or chart two? Okay, remember for molecule A, we said that it's going to be absorbing ultraviolet light. Remember, ultraviolet light has a lot more energy than let's say the yellow light that this other molecule, molecule B was absorbing. Thus, A would be assigned to chart one and B would be assigned to chart two because B is going to be absorbing at a wavelength higher than chart one, than, than molecule one. And we see here in chart two that it's a low energy difference in a higher wavelength. Which one has a higher wavelength between A and B? B does, right? So that's why, you know, that's just the, the, the explanation of the mechanism behind ultraviolet light. Okay, so just to talk about this other concept, redshift and blue shift. So remember we talked about how if you're, uh, what's it called? If you have a, a high conjugation, you're going to have you're going to be absorbing a high wavelength. So basically, a redshift or a blue shift that I have here in my notes. So redshift, let's just say RS, and then blue shift is BS. If we have a redshift and a blue shift, well, basically, what a redshift is is that you're increasing in the wavelength absorbed. So remember, if you're having a higher conjugation, that means that you're going to be in increasing in the wavelength that you're absorbing, which means it's going to be going towards the red, right? Because remember, we said that red had the highest wavelength from all of the uh, visible light, right? So that's a redshift. So if we were to shift from A or B, the, the line would be in this direction, right? This would be a redshift, why? Because this one is absorbing a higher wavelength. Blue shift is just the opposite. It's just a decrease in the wavelength absorbed. Remember, the decrease in wavelength, the smaller the wavelength, the higher the frequency, because remember, wavelength and frequency are reciprocals. And if you have a high frequency, you have a high energy. So blue shift would be a decrease in wavelength absorbed. So it'd be going this way. A, a, a blue shift would be going from molecules B to molecules A. All right.
So that's basically the rundown that you're going to require for ultraviolet for the MCAT. They're probably just going to ask you, okay, we have this system here. We have this other compound. We have, so we have a compound, we have another compound. Which compound would absorb um, a higher wavelength of light? And okay, well, now that you know it, um, you're going to say, well, the compound that has a higher conjugation. Okay, let's go into infrared spectroscopy. Okay, so UV light told us about conjugation. What is infrared spectroscopy gonna tell us? Well, basically um, infrared spectroscopy, which is, as you can tell by the name infrared, remember Roy G. Biv? Roy, Roy G. Biv is going to be our best friends for spectroscopy. Um, <clears throat> so for Roy G. Biv, infrared, which means, remember ultraviolet was down here. Infrared is going to be higher than, than visible light. It's gonna be in this region, okay? So it means it has a higher wavelength, AKA lower energy than visible light, right? So if you had the choice, man, do you wanna get shot in the eye with infrared or ultraviolet? Well, ultraviolet has a smaller wavelength, means it has more energy. So you kinda of wanna avoid ultraviolet to the face and you'd prefer to like, hey man, let me get some of that IR. And I'd be like, all right, here you go, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Oh no, that was so crazy. Oh, <laughs> okay. I hope no one watches this video. <laughs> oh my God, okay, I'm making it worse. All right, so infrared spectroscopy. <laughs> What does it tell you? Oh my gosh. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So infrared spectroscopy, what it tells you is it, it kind of informs you as to what type of bonds you have in your compound, right? You take a compound, you, you, you irritate it with some IR and it's going to be like, oh, well, you have this type of bond. You also have this type of bond. Okay. Well, that's basically the information that you're, that you're given um, from infrared spectroscopy. So what, why does, uh, okay, so like, what's the mechanism of IR? Like we talked about the mechanism of UV vis. What is the mechanism of IR? So this range right here uh, with, the, with the infrared from 2.5 to 20 micrometers, just remember when we're talking about visible light, we're talking about nanometers. Micrometers is bigger because micro is 10 to the negative six and nano is 10 to the negative nine. So a, a lower size, right? So micrometers are bigger than, than, than um, the nanometers. So this is the range for the IR. We shoot a molecule with IR spectroscopy or an IR, uh, let's say just a ray. And what's going to happen is that we have a stretching of the bonds that is being hit and that is actually absorbing the IR. So a bond has to first absorb the IR before it stretches. And then when it absorbs the IR, remember we, we talked about the ground electron moving up to the higher uh, energy electron. Well, that's basically is going to be shown with a movement of your your bonds, so a somatic so a cis, uh, so a symmetric stretch is one version of the of the vibration that occurs from the the bonds absorption of of IR. So your bond is going to be vibrating whenever it absorbs IR. So a symmetric stretch is basically a, the bonds, like say these covalent bonds, they're both pointing out in the same direction at the same time. They go like bounce, 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 like but at the same time, like equivalently, kind of like. Um, like if you're like throwing up your arms and making a Y is doing that constantly. What is an asymmetric stretch? Well, basically it's throwing up one arm and then putting it back down and then throwing out another arm. So it's not doing, it's not throwing out the arms at the same time, but you're just throwing out one and then you're throwing out the other. So that's an asymmetric stretch. A symmetric bond is like when you're doing a jumping jack, right? You bring your hands up and then you make a, a, a triangle with your hands and you bring them back down, right? That's a symmetric bond. However, the asymmetric bend, sorry, I was, I was saying bond, like asymmetric bend, the asymmetric bend is when you have, let's say when you're doing the YMCA, it's when you're making the C, your hands go in the same direction. They're not like both going and meeting in the middle. Your arms are going, making a C, right? It's gonna be all pointing and rotating in one direction. That's an asymmetric bend, okay? So those are different kinds of vibrations that your molecule can have. So if the, if the uh, organic chemistry passage is like, oh, you, you're, you're irritated with your, a special kind of light and it caused a symmetric stretch. You're like, oh, I know that symmetric stretch occurs with the IR spectroscopy. So this light, this, this unknown light source is actually going to be infrared light. Okay, so, so that's the mechanism of IR. All right, so what can it tell you? Again, it can, ah, I misspelled distinguished, okay, oops. All right, so uh, the IR is gonna tell you what kinds of bonds you're dealing with. And what kinds of bonds you deal with can tell you about functional groups, right? Because a, a carbonyl bond, like so, uh, a carbon attached to a oxygen group, right? Is different from like, so we're talking about the bond right here, 
is different from a carbon attached to an alcohol, right? This bond, these bonds are clearly different. And so the IR is basically going to tell you, okay, hey man, like we're not going to tell you the specifics of your compound. Like we're not going to tell you the exact connectivity. Like we can't tell you, like let's say if your compound looks like this, like something, you know, wild. Like we're not going to, I mean, it's not really that wild, but if we have something like this, we're not going to tell you specifically what your structure looks like. All we're going to tell you with the IR spectroscopy is what functional groups are present. So instead of like knowing the structure of the molecule, all you're going to know is that there is a carbonyl and that there is an alcohol somewhere in your bond or in your, in your molecule. So like, why is that? Like, why would we do that if it, even though it's like not very specific? Well, let's say we had like a molecule like C, like CHO, and like just like give X and Y to CH and like just say O has only one oxygen. Well, if we use IR, we can determine what kind of oxygen that is, right? Because we can look at the kind of bonds that we're dealing with. Like, let's say maybe it's a carbonyl oxygen or maybe an alcohol oxygen. With infrared light, we're going to be able to derive that information. So just to reiterate from the, from the mechanism that we talked about for spectroscopy, these bonds are going to be absorbing infrared light at different energies, right? So the, I, the, the IR uh, energy wavelength that this carbonyl bond absorbs is going to be different from the waves that this alcohol group absorbs. And that's what makes uh, IR and spectroscopy in general so very effective is that, okay, so let's say that this is your range right here for IR. You have a bunch of like other waves in the middle and then that's your range. So let's say the carbonyl is going to absorb this range and then the alcohol is going to absorb this range, right? So they're different and we are able to scrutinize um, that difference and derive very specific data about, about your, your, your molecule when you shine an IR uh, at it. Okay, so we talked about how the bond absorbs the wavelength in the infrared uh, in the, in the infrared region. So how can we say, um, okay, your bond, the, okay, bond A absorbs this wavelength? Or organic chemists, you know, they're just like, eh, uh, well, we're not, okay, although we are absorbing wavelength, our bonds are vibrating like crazy. So let's just say that we're actually looking at vibrational frequency rather than wavelength, right? Rather than saying vibrational wavelength, let's say vibrational frequency that everyone's like, okay, cool. So when you have vibrational frequency, you have a different unit. So we're not going to be dealing with wavelength. We're rather going to be dealing with wave number, right? So wave number is just indicating vibrational frequency. Vibrational frequency is the same thing as this region right here. Like all of this, like this is the IR region. You know, this is the type of wavelengths that you're dealing with. But the wave number is the exact same thing as this, but it's just in a different form. Same thing with like grams or, or, or like uh, kilograms or whatever it's, or well, not exactly like that. Like let's say like grams and pounds, right? They're two different measurements. The same thing with the wave number and the and the wavelength. It's just a conversion. So what is the conversion between wavelength and wave number? Well, if you guys remember, uh, wavelength and frequency are reciprocals of each other. Right? Like so, wavelength would be like this, and the reciprocal like so. This would be frequency. Like the frequency and wavelength are reciprocal. So if you exchange this denominator for the f, then we would get frequency, right? So they're interchangeable. They're, they are reciprocals of each other. So basically the wave number or V dash is just expressed by one over the wavelength of which your bond absorbed from the IR spectra, or you can say one over the speed of light, which is C, which is three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second times frequency. And here frequency is expressed with a V, not an F for some reason. Okay. So that's wave number. So this is a very simplified form of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, e equation used to derive a wave number. Wave numbers can actually like be very like to calculate them rather than using actual spectroscopy. You can, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> you can actually, uh, what's it called? Uh, use math and derive your wave number than actually using the spectroscopy. Like actually not the, the equation is super convoluted and you deal with like electronegativity components and you deal with like bond strength. So you don't need to know that for the MCAT. You just need to know that wave number. It's just the, 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 it's just the X axis for your IR spectroscopy. So we're going to get into that in a second. Okay. So again, when a bond absorbs IR radiation, that specific frequency, frequency is taken up by the bond. So, uh, and not the IR detector. So let's, let's say we have a compound. So just to explain that sentence a little bit, let's say we have a compound, it's doing its thing. It's right there. Let's say we have a detector that's like this. And let's say we have a beam of IR coming in this direction, right? 
we have IR. We don't know what, what this compound is going to absorb. So we just, we just shoot it with the entire range of IR. So like this is like the higher, this is the higher range of IR. And this is the lower range of IR. So like uh, it'd be 2.5 and then 20 micrometers. And we're just going to shoot it all in this direction, right? Well, these wavelengths are going to be hitting the detector, right? The ones that don't interact with the, with the compound. However, the IR or the, the wave that actually interacts with that, that molecule, that molecule is going to absorb. Remember, spectroscopy is all about the absorption of photons. So this compound right here, or this bond that we're working with, is going to absorb some of that IR. And so some of it is not going to like make it to the, the, to the detector as much as these other ones, right? These other ones weren't affected at all. They're 100% going to make it to the, for, to the detector. However, the, uh, the, the, the waves that were not, that were actually absorbed, sorry, that were absorbed by the bond, it's like some of it might come into the detector, some of it might not, right? So the transmittance of these waves to the detector is not going to be 100%, right? Because some of it was absorbed by the bond. Okay, so let's explain all of that. And we have it right here in our chart of IR. So right here, we have transmittance. That's the, that's the concept that we were just talking about right here with the detector and all that. So let's say right here, we have 100% transmittance. Like, and we, over here, we have 0% transmittance. If we have 100% transmittance, that means we shot the IR wave and it didn't interact with anything and just straight up it hit the detector. 100% of the intensity of that IR spec was transmitted, right? So that's 100% transmittance. And as you can see over here in this dip, we have a transmittance, like let's say over here, we have a transmittance like maybe like maybe 7%, right? It's like a really, really low transmittance. Why? It's because there's a bond that absorbed the IR spectra in this region. So only a little bit of that IR was actually hitting the detector. The rest of it was actually absorbed by this bond. And that's why we have these dips, right? All these dips show that the IR was, was absorbed at this area. And for that reason, transmittance is not 100%. Like over here, we have like close to 100% transmittance, or we have close to 100% transmittance. We go all the way down here, however, and we see that some bonds were absorbing some of the IR spectra, which means that, you know, the IR didn't reach the detector as much as it possibly could have, right? The, it's not a 100% transmittance. Okay, so let's let's talk about this, like, uh, this, this chart. So here we have transmittance on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have the wave number. Remember, just wave number is, a, is another way to express the wavelength. So like this peak right here, this, 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 uh, this uh, figure right here, this kind of like broad U-shape is going to be absorbing at the around 340, uh, 3,400 wave number. And wave number, again, we could just reciprocate, like we, we would do these reciprocal of it, and then we'll find the wavelength. Uh, just remember that the wave number, like the unit is in, in uh, cent uh, reciprocal centimeters. So I here have it as, as C minus, CM minus, but I, just, I couldn't figure out how to put the minus on top. So it's just reciprocal centimeters. That just means one over centimeters. So that's the unit of wave number. Oh, sorry if you were trying to copy that down. I constantly do that. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, what was it? Mm, oh, CM minus, right? Okay. So, all right, so let's look at some more information. So here I have like a bunch of definitions for IR that you're going to need. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so as we mentioned before, IR is not going to tell you the specific uh, structure of a molecule. And for that reason, it's mainly just used to monitor reactions. Like let's say, our job as a chemist is to like attach a carbonyl group to a carbon. So we would shoot an IR to the, to the reactants. Okay, there's no carbonyl. We shoot an IR to the products. We, may, we find a, a carbonyl group on the infrared spec. Okay, cool, we did our job, right? So um, yeah, it's not gonna give you the exact connectivity. Wave number is the proportion of frequency, is, is proportional to frequency. Thus, the higher the wave number, the higher the, the energy. Yeah, another thing to note, just remember that uh, wave number is reciprocal of wavelength. And what's the other thing that's a reciprocal wavelength? Frequency. What is frequency proportional to? Energy. So the higher the wave number, the higher the energy, right? Okay. And uh, wave number is expressed in reciprocal centimeters. Okay. So strength is a term used for transmittance, right? So we can see this, this, uh, this peak right here. It's all the way down uh, close to 7% transmittance. And this other peak though, let's say over here, it's not, it's not that far down. There is some transmittance, but there's not as much. So this bond didn't absorb IR as much as this one. So this, this just tells you strength, right? This, this really deep down groove, it has more strength than this one 
This one has about the same strength as this one. This one, this peak right here has a little bit more strength than, than these two. Uh, these, this one is pretty uh, strong. This one's pretty strong. So strength just tells you transmittance, right? If it's really strong, it has a high transmittance, uh, meaning that's going to absorb a lot of the IR. Okay, what does intensity tell you? It's the sharpness of, or, oh, that's supposed to be or, or distinctiveness of the peak made by the bond absorbance. So let's say right here, like this is a broad peak. It's not really that distinguished. If we say over here, like this is a really distinguished peak. So it's really intense, right? That's the definition, like the intensity. On the other hand, we have broadness, right? So on one hand, we have like this really, this really thin peak here, very distinguished peak, so that's intensity. On the other hand, we have this other peak that's really broad, right? So whenever we have, you know, typically you're going to be finding these intense peaks, right? Just the intense peaks are just like all over the place. If you have a broad peak, that just tells you that there's hydrogen bonding involved, right? Remember, we talked about hydrogen bonding. If you have a broad peak like this, just know that there is going to be a hydrogen covalently attached, attached to a, a uh, electronegative atom. And that uh, electronegative atom and that in the, the hydrogen bond donor is going to be uh, finding a lone pair and blah, blah, blah. And this broad peak is caused by hydrogen bonding. Okay, so that's it for this slide. I was about to ask if anyone had any questions, but again, if, I mean, if you do have questions, feel free to definitely uh, text me. Okay, so here we have IR spectra. Let's distinguish some of these regions. Okay, so we are most likely going to be looking at the, I mean, we are going to be looking at the uh, region that is higher than 1,500. Any region that's below 1,500, like these groups right here, is called the fingerprint region. And the reason why they call it fingerprint region is because it's very, very specific to the compound and it takes a really skilled eye to actually determine what like these peaks mean. Like some of these peaks can be very, very niche and like very like uh, just like uh, uh, complex to 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 actually uh, like it's not simple. Like we over here, if you know from uh, from before in Orgo that this broad peak, it just tells you you have an alcohol group. Like right here, I have all the groups that you need to know. Like this broad peak here is between the the wave numbers of um, uh, 3,200 uh, 3, and 3,650 uh, and it's broad. So, okay, if you knew that this is an OH, there's an OH, but in this fingerprint region, it takes a really skilled eye to determine what these groups are, but okay. So, <clears throat> so look at, let's look at these groups. We have a, we have a broad band over here. We have a, a two peak over here at the 3,000 range. That just tells you that there is a carbon attached to a hydrogen. And uh, just something to note, is that if a uh, carbon is attached to a hydrogen and the carbon is like sp3, then it's going to be over here in this region. However, if the carbon is sp2 or sp, meaning it has uh, more s character, because remember s character just means that you know you have an s orbital and you have three p orbitals. If you have more s character, that means you only maybe hybridize with just one p orbital, right? The less uh, percentage of, 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 of s character means that you have a bunch of p orbitals mixing in with this S character. But if we just had these two, then that's 50% S character. After you add this one, be like 33% S character. And after you add this other P group, you have a 25% S character. So the higher S character, the more along the way your CH uh, region, like your CH bond is going to be uh, in your IR spectra. Okay, let me raise this real quick. All right, so <clears throat> just some quick notes. Um, uh, <laughs> I should actually move this over here like that. That's yeah, good. All right, so some uh, really quick uh, uh, notes is that if you ever heard that Fetty Wap song, like seven, uh, dude, I feel so awkward with this online setting. Um, you ever heard that song like 1738? Yeah, so like if that song um, is from Fetty Wap, <laughs> And that'll tell you your carbonyl group, right? So your carbonyl group is most likely going to be in that 1738 region, like this region right here. It's like really close to 2000. Whenever you see a region in that, and in, in whenever you see a peak in that region around seven, uh, 1735 to, uh, to, six, uh, to 1680, you're going to have a carbonyl group. And it could be any carbonyl group, like a carboxylic acid. It can be an amide. It can be an ester, right? It just, it just has to have a carbonyl, right? This thing is... is, is um, indicating that there's a carbonyl group in your molecule. If you have, uh, let's say, excuse me, a, a carboxylic acid, well, you might think, oh, but there's a carbonyl group right next to the OH and that OH is acidic. Like, is it, 
actually going to have the same thing as a as a uh, as like as a regular alcohol group. So like let's say there's just an alcohol group right here. Excuse me. And then we have a carboxylic acid. You see how they both have OHs, like an OH over here and OH over here. So it's like, oh, is it actually going to like have the broadband? Like, yes. Even if the uh, carbox, even if the OH is like in the carboxylic acid, uh, like if it's a component of a carboxylic acid, it's still going to have that OH region. That's a, that's a question that I had um, back when I was doing this in Orgo, and I thought maybe some of you guys might have it too. So uh, for amines, remember an amine is a, it's a nitrogen attached to a, a, a carbon. A primary amine it means that uh, nitrogen is only attached to one carbon. And remember, amine or nitrogen likes to have three bonds, which means that the two remaining bonds are hydrogens. So if you have a, a primary amine, you're going to have a peak that has two, like two mountains like that. If you have a secondary amine, a secondary amine looks like this. And then one hydrogen, because it prefers, remember, just three bonds, then you're going to have just one peak, right? Rather than those two peaks that a primary amine would have. Okay. So just to uh, talk about a little bit of the uh, exclusivity of IR. So not everything that has a covalent bond is going to display the IR spectrum. Only polar bonds do, and they're called IR active. Okay, so what does this all mean, right? So remember we talked about how <clears throat> when you shoot a bond with IR, uh, 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 an IR, let's say gun, then what you're going to have is the bonds are gonna be vibrating, right? So when the bonds vibrate, like let's say uh, uh, an OH here, hydrogen group, let's say we shot this thing with some IR. So then the bonds are going to be vibrating and they're going to be doing their thing, right? So you see how there's a difference here. And remember we talked about how, uh, uh, when we talked about hydrogen bonding that the electron density for the oxygen is going to be uh, higher than the electron density for the hydrogen because the electron density is gonna be pulled towards the oxygen. Well, here we have a dipole moment, right? So, I mean, here uh, in the unirradiated uh, uh, water molecule, we still have an ipolar bond. It's our apolar relationship. However, in this uh, IR irradiated water molecule, we're gonna have an even greater dipole. So whenever you have polar bonds like this bond right here, and they are, you know, irradiated, and, and they, they create this, this kind of like uh, a semi-permanent uh, polar kind of uh, configuration, then you're going to have something that's IR active. So let's look at different things that are maybe strongly shown on the IR spec, things that are mediumly shown on the, on the IR spec, and things that are weakly shown on the IR spec, aka maybe not even going to be present because they're not IR active. So that's something you might see on the, on the exam. It's like, okay, is this bond IR active? And they're going to show you different kinds of, of bonds. And then you're going to be like, okay, this one is, this one is not. Okay, so let's look at those examples. <clears throat> So remember we said that polar bonds means that they are, are, are IR active. And let's see an example of a strong polar bond. Well, we can have a carbonyl group, right? A carbonyl group, this carbon doesn't is not as electronegative as the oxygen. So we're definitely going to have a polar or a, a dipole moment, right? The electron density is gonna be pointing up towards the oxygen. Okay, let's talk about maybe a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen. Well, not only does polarity affect whether something is IR, IR, IR active, excuse me, but also the, the, uh, the symmetry found in the molecule. So here, remember we talked about how in sigma bonds you can rotate, you can do your thing, whatever. But if you have a pi bond, especially if you have two pi bonds, you're gonna have some steric restriction, right? So here we have a little bit of symmetry, right? This like this uh, nitrogen is not going to be rotating around. It's not going to be doing its thing. It's just going to be really just a straight line. So there's a bit of a symmetry. However, the carbon is not as electronegative than the nitrogen. Thus, the, uh, we're going to have a dipole moment, right? So this one is going to be a strong. This one's going to be a medium example. That's a U. Oh, okay, it doesn't look like a U. Uh, medium. Okay, so let's look at a weak example of uh, something that is IR active. Let's say a triple bond. So this here molecule, like those carbons, they have the same exact electro uh, negativity. So it's like, wait, why are they IR active? And it's because they're not symmetrical, right? If you were to cut this bond right here, remember whenever we talked about IR, we're not talking about the atoms, we're talking about the bonds themselves. Like we're talking about this here bond talking about this bond. We don't care about the carbon. We don't care about the nitrogen. We care about the, the characteristics 
of the bond. I mean, of course, the characteristics of, of the bond determines is determined by what is attached to, but we're really touched looking at the bond when we're looking at if something is IR active or not. So let's look at this bond here. Here we have that it's attached to a carbon. So you have the atoms are, are important. I, I, I guess I kind of guessed it, oops. Uh, so the carbon here is uh, attached to this other carbon. They have the same exact electronegativity. So they're not going to have really much of a dipole moment. However, they're not perfectly uh, symmetrical, right? So this uh, carbon has a hydrogen, this one has a methyl. And for that reason, it's a weekly, it's going to be weakly presented on the IR spec. Now let's look at something that is probably, it's actually IR inactive, so it's not going to be showing up on the spec. Well, as you can guess, it's going to be something that doesn't have any dipole. So like the same atom, like an N, so an N bonded, triple bonded to an N, even though both of these things are highly, highly electronegative, um, this is not a polar bond. Why? Because these two things have the same electronegativity and their symmetry. So this thing is also going to be IR inactive. So let's just finish up this example here. We have like a CH3 and a CH3 here. This bond right here, it has symmetry. The uh, bond, the, the atoms attached to it are not, uh, do not have a difference in electronegativity. So this is going to be IR inactive. Inactive, okay? So all you have to do for IR spectroscopy, the, the, the main thing that you really need to take away, like if, if you don't remember anything, just remember this, just remember these numbers, like just straight up memorize them. There's no other way to like, um, like maybe you want to like learn the formula and then do all that by, you know, that's, this is a huge waste of time. I would say like, it's just a really complex formula. There's like a fraction in there. <laughs> like it's kind of uh, nuts. So I would definitely just uh, memorize this, these numbers. Uh, uh, as we talked about before, a carbonyl group is going to be in this range. Uh, you really need to like you for the for for your for your 528. Please remember that an OH or a hydroxyl group is going to be in this region right here from 3,200 to uh, 3,650, and it looks like this. So just if you don't if you don't remember anything else, just remember the carbonyl group and the OH group. Like those things are going to be really important. Why? Because the CH group, well, this is organic chemistry. So you're going to be seeing a bunch of CH groups. So that's not really that important. The things I really need to take note of, I would say is definitely the OH, definitely the carbonyl, and then the triple bonds are also important as well. Okay, so let's go into our second to last topic. Uh, it's going to be uh, HNMR. Oh my God, my, lap is about, my laptop is about to die. If I didn't, if I had to record all that again, I would probably just uh, resign. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about NMR. So before we were talking about, uh, what's it called? Uh, 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 how, you know, if you shoot a compound with some light, then you can derive some sort of information from that compound. So in HNMR, we are going to be shooting our compound with some light to derive information. But first, we are going to make sure that there is some nuclear spin on the nuclei of our compound. Okay, so like, what does that look like, right? So if we were to introduce a compound to a magnetic field, remember if you took physics too, that magnetic fields interact with things that have charges, right? So if you have your nuclei, which is positively charged, if you have a uh, nuclei introduced to a magnetic field, what's going to happen is going to create something called nuclear spin, okay? So when your compound is busy doing its nuclear spinning, we're going to shoot that compound with a light source and then it's going to absorb that light source, shoot a photon back, and then we're going to have information, right? So that's how, that's the basic mechanism of nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR. You have first uh, introduced the compound to the magnetic field, you shoot it with light, the, the nuclear spin is going to do something with that light, it's going to shoot the light back out and we're going to derive information, right? That's the whole thing of spectroscopy. All right, so, oh, <laughs> that's, that's why I said it twice because I knew I missed something and I missed it again. I'm not going to say the whole mechanism, but basically you have the nuclei, you put that bad boy into the magnetic field, you shoot it with some, uh, what's it called, with some light, and then the photon comes back out. And then the information that you get is going to be the nucleus's chemical environment. So that's going to be the information that we get from this specific uh, spectroscopy before. We, for, for IR, what we got was um, the, the bond identity for UV this, we got conjugation. For NMR, we are going to be getting the nucleus's chemical environment, right? So let's get into it. So, uh, so there's going to be two types of NMR that you're going to be finding on the MCAT. 
uh, hydrogen NMR and carbon NMR. So the, all this stuff that I'm talking about here for hydrogen NMR, like I have the example, like all HNMR, 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 all of these concepts also apply to carbon NMR. So like whatever I say for HNMR is going to, it's just, I'm not gonna say it twice for carbon NMR, right? So it just, it's, it's um, the same rules apply. Okay, so let's, let's see here. <clears throat> Uh, what's really uh, great about NMR and this technology is that chemists are actually able to derive a structure, a really experienced organic chemist can divide, derive the exact structure from their NMR spectroscopy, right? So before in the IR, all we can get was that there's certain functional groups in there. Like you really can't derive the actual connectivity of our, of our compound, just that there's specific things that are attached to it. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Um, in infrared, we're going to be finding that, uh, I'm sorry, not infrared, in UV vis, we're going to be finding that we have a conjugated system and how conjugated it might be. And the, oh, maybe that's why, because I keep breathing in so fast. I'm like, dude, because the reason why I, I pause is because like a bubble gets stuck in my throat. And I'm like, why is that happening? It's because I keep gulping down air. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just chill out. <laughs> All right. So in NMR, yeah, there's like wondering why is that happening. All right, so in NMR, we're going to be having the uh, thing. What was oh, okay? So we're going to be having the organic chemist actually create a like recreate a structure from the information that they receive. Like if an organic chemist sees this, they can create this molecule, right? They can, and this molecule has very specific connectivity. So that's what's really cool about NMR, uh, specifically HNMR and, and and CNMR. You can really derive the 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 um, the uh, Sorry, I'm at a loss of words. The, the, the exact chemical structure of your compound, whereas the other ones is just like, it gives you a little bit of information. This one, you can get the exact, exact structure. Okay, so let's get into it. So we're going to need to know four concepts for us to tackle NMR. The first thing is resonances. So not resonance, like in conjugation, just resonance, right? So what resonance tells you is the number of non-equivalent hydrogens, AKA resonances. So a non-equivalent hydrogen, let's say hydrogen A and hydrogen B, let's say they're non-equivalent, they're just different hydrogens, they exist in different chemical environments. That's what it means to be a non-equivalent hydrogen. They exist in different environments, different locations, they have different arms, like, I mean, not arms, but like different substituents attached to them. So kind of like when we were assigning configuration and we were looking at like, for example, uh, let's say these, we have a chiral sensor here, like we have all this junk, and let's say there's a methyl here and there's an ethyl here. Well, then like uh, eventually we have an OH here, and then eventually like let's say closer we have an OH here. Well, this OH is super far away from the chiral sensor, right? So it's not going to be equivalent to this OH, right? This this OH is kind of close, so it, it exists in different chemical environments, right? So that's what it means to be a non-equivalent hydrogen. It just means that it doesn't share the exact same chemical environment, and uh, resonance is, tells you how many non-equivalent hydrogens you've got, right? So let's say, uh, for example, if we were to get a resonance of two, then that means we have two non-equivalent hydrogens, A and B, right? So uh, a resonance tells you how many uh, non-equivalent hydrogens you have. Let's show an example and, and let's find how many resonances this compound has. Okay, if we had this compound right here, for example, we have a, an, an ethane group with a alcohol. So this is ethanol, right? If we were to look at this compound here and if I were to ask you, hey, how many resonances, AKA non-equivalent hydrogens does this thing have? Well, you're going to look at this molecule and you're gonna be like, okay, like which hydrogens here are non-equivalent? Like they have different chemical environments. So I'm going to be drawing them in, in different colors. Oops, shoots. Uh, Um, no, that's not good. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay, so sorry, my like pen was acting weird for a second. This is like uh, bugging out. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say, okay, we're looking for the non equivalent hydrogens for this here compound. Let's do it in different colors. So here we have three hydrogens, right? They're just not drawn in. Like we have a hydrogen here, have a hydrogen here, and have a hydrogen here. So, okay, we have these three hydrogens. Cool. Um, they all, you know, they're all part of this carbon. Sorry, <clears throat> keeps happening again. And then we have uh, you know, these hydrogens over here on this carbon. As you can tell, the hydrogens on this carbon have a different environment than the hydrogens on this carbon. Well, 
Why is that? It's because, Jesus, really bad. <laughs> the hydrogens on this carbon have an OH group next to them, and then it has this methyl group, whereas these hydrogens just have this kind of CH2 group, and then eventually there's an OH group. But as you can tell, they're not in the exact same thing, right? For them to be equivalent, there has to be some sort of symmetry. For example, if we were to have this molecule right here, well, then we can see that there's some symmetry, right? So the hydrogens on this here compound would be the exact same hydrogens on this here compound, I'm uh, sorry, and this here carbon. And these hydrogens would be the exact same thing as these hydrogens, right? Because they, are, they share the exact same chemical environment. Like these hydrogens here, they have a CH2 bonded to them, and then the CH2 is bonded to an oxygen. And these carbons and these hydrogens over here, they have a CH2 bonded to them, and they have an oxygen bonded to them. And, then, and so that makes them equivalent. And then for these hydrogens, we have a methyl on this end, and then an ether on this end. For these carbons, sorry, for these hydrogens, we have a methyl on this end, and an ether on this end, and it's just the exact same structure, right? So it'd be different if we had something like this. Like there's no symmetry here, right? If you were to draw like there's just an extra carbon here. So it's, there's not gonna be symmetry. So these hydrogens would be different. These would be different hydrogen, I'm gonna draw as a square. These hydrogens would be different. These hydrogens would be different. Uh, let me think of another shape, a triangle. And then these hydrogens would be different because there's no symmetry, right? So let's think of a, a, a let's see here, a rhombus, no, a trapezoid. I haven't drawn one since one of those since like uh, middle school, a trapezoid. Okay. Why were trapezoids hard? <laughs> Remember that time when trapezoids were hard? <laughs> okay. All right. So we have, okay, for this one, because there's no symmetry, we have actually five resonances, right? Because they're, they're, they're just different. Here we would have two resonances because we have this methyl and this methyl, they're just the exact same thing. These groups are the exact same thing. Okay, let's go back to our example, right? So I have these hydrogens here. They're not equivalent to these hydrogens because they're in a different chemical environment. And this hydrogen on the oxygen, well, look, it's just bonded to an oxygen. These hydrogens are bonded to a carbon. So of course, this is going, this is going to be a non-equivalent hydrogen. So in this molecule right here, we're going to have three, like in total, like in, in net, like we're going to have three non-equivalent hydrogens, right? We have these hydrogens, we have these hydrogens, and then we have this hydrogen, right? So it's going to be three non-equivalent hydrogens, aka three resonances. So it's going to have three resonance. This one's going to have five resonances. Oh, that's that's five resonance. And this one has two resonances. Okay. Um, so that's that's basically what it means to be a non-equivalent hydrogen. I'm going to be giving you guys another example. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit more difficult to see. So let's just draw it out. If you can get this though, then you should be fine for uh, for uh, non-equivalent hydrogens. Like if you can get this one, then you should be really set. Okay, so if you look at this, it kind of oh, it's not it's not properly drawn. It's hard to see. Okay, let me draw that again. And then let's say like that. Okay, that looks better. Kind of. Oh my God, I drew it perfectly this morning. Oh man, all right. Let me just turn my, let me just grab my Picasso hat. Maybe if I don't think about it, or if I don't think about it, maybe it comes out better. And it, oh, <laughs> I'm saying it did, but it didn't. Okay, basically, why does it look like a Y? <laughs> How did I do this before? What? All right, let me give it one more go. And then if I don't get it, then I don't get it. And I'm just, I have my, 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 my uh, official title as scrub. All right, let's see here. Okay. Have it like this. We'll have it like that. Oh my God, dude. All righty, that's awful. Okay, <laughs> no, I can't. Okay, but basically, what this was trying to, man, it doesn't even. Okay, one last time. I know I'm. Okay, this is literally gonna be. 
Oh no. I don't care anymore. <gasps> Wait a second. This could be the chosen one. No, it wasn't. All right. <laughs> but basically, we have a carbon here, carbon here. These two, you know, they're pretty much equivalent. Why? Because they have the same substituents. Like I have a carbon here and then a vertice, a carbon here and then a vertice. Well, these carbons, you know, they're pretty much the same thing as these carbons. Why? Because these carbons also have a carbon here and then a vertice and then a vertice over here. And then eventually this thing is basically kind of looks like two rings fused together, right? So all of these carbons that are at the end, they're all the equivalent, right? Because they just share the same chemical environment. So how many resonance does this thing have? It actually has two resonance because we have a hydrogen over here too. And those things are like on a tertiary carbon. This one, these hydrogens on this one only are on a secondary carbon. So they're different. There's actually two resonances or non-equivalent hydrogens. Resonances. I don't know. I haven't been feeling funny lately. I just been, my mojo has been gone or something. I don't know, something, uh, I don't know what it is. I can't make a joke anymore. It sucks. All right. So <clears throat> now let's talk about HNMR integration. Okay, so integration just basically tells you the area underneath the peak of your signal or your resonance, right? Like each resonance is going to have its own signal on the, on the uh, HNMR spectra. So um, the integration is just going to tell you how many hydrogens there are really under that, that have that same exact chemical environment. So as we talked about here in our example, in this example, we have three resonances. One has three equivalent hydrogens, like all of these are the same thing. These hydrogens are equivalent to each other and this hydrogen is equivalent to each other. So how would the integration look, right? So the more hydrogens that are shared that are equivalent, the higher integration. So this one right here, they just call it A, this one's B, this one's C. So the A, and this is B and C is over here. The A would look like this. B would look a little bit like this because there's only two hydrogens that are equivalent and C would look like that, right? Because there's way more hydrogens that, uh, that have the same environment here. There's only two here and there's only one that has the same environment for this, for this uh, hydroxyl group, right? So this would be integration. It just tells you, uh, it shows you uh, how many hydrogens are shared uh, underneath that, that, it's that same chemical and environment thing, right? So if we were to draw this, like the, the, the integration for this here molecule, it would look something like this, right? We only have two resonances. This one has three hydrogens over here. This one has three hydrogens over here. These three hydrogens are going to add with these three hydrogens. Why? Because they're all equivalent, which means that it's going to be six hydrogens in total. So it's gonna be pretty tall, it's gonna be a tall peak. And then these hydrogens on this carbon molecule and these hydrogens on this carbon molecule are equivalent. So it's gonna be a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here. That's four hydrogens total. It's not going to be as tall as six, but it's going to be decently tall. It's going to be like that, right? And then we can do the we can do the integration for this one. But it's going to take a while, so we just just uh, let's like look at our example. So like here, for example, <clears throat> like the H's right there. Like there's three green H's, so the integration is going to be really high, right? So that means that there's a lot of those H's. In the red, we only have two. And that's like not that tall. And then the uh, in the blue, we have uh, a slightly taller one. So the reason why this one, even though it has three uh, hydrogens, why it's not taller than this one is going to be explained by the chemical shifts, which we're going to be talking about later on. Okay, so we talked about HNMR resonances. We talked about HNMR integration. Now let's talk about HNMR splitting. Okay, what does HNMR splitting look like? Let's get rid of these graphs real quick. Okay, basically, remember when we talked about the, the nuclear spin? So the nuclear spin is caused by the nucleus being in a magnetic field and it's spinning and it's spinning and spinning. And what occurs is that if you have a proton that is, let's say proton A, right? And then proton B is close to it. And, and well, oh, I say proton, but a proton means a hydrogen or, or let's just say hydrogens, right? So let's say you have a hydrogen, hydrogen A, and then you have another hydrogen, hydrogen B. And if they're three sigma bonds away from each other, they're actually, and they're non-equivalent, then they're going to be causing uh, more of that, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, nuclear spin than, uh, than we had before, right? So the HNMR splitting, so just to read the definition is neighboring non-equivalent as we said before, like over here, like hydrogens A, and then over here we have hydrogens B. So there's going to be uh, some sort of splitting going on because these uh, hydrogens are non-equivalent and their neighboring hydrogens on a different atom must be three must be within three sigma bonds away. 
causes resonance to split. Thus, we know there are other hydrogens close by, which helps with identifying structure. Splitting, oh, splitting occurs because the magnetic spin of one proton can affect the other non-equivalent proton, right? So basically what I just said. Uh, <clears throat> okay, but what does HNMR splitting looks like? Uh, let's say we have this peak here. Uh, this peak is like doing its thing. And then <clears throat> we have splitting, right? So let's say for this, for these uh, hydrogens right here, uh, remember it has to be within three sigma bonds away. So like right here, we start at the H. This is one sigma bond right here. This is another sigma bond over here. And then another sigma bond, a third sigma bond. And we, we reach a hydrogen. Well, let's look at the uh, sigma bonds over here. So the sigma bond for this uh, hydroxyl group, there's one here between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Then we're going to go to another one between the oxygen and the carbon, and then another one between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So these guys are actually neighbors. However, if we're looking at the hydrogens on, on the carbon A, so let's say like a hydrogen here. So I mean, this is a sigma bond here. So that's one, two, three, and then four, because there's a bond right here. So it's actually four sigma bonds away. So those are actually not going to be neighbors. Only things that are three sigma bonds away, the way that I like to think about it is like the carbon right next to it or the, or the, the, uh, the, 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 the carbon that's, yeah. So basically carbon or the atom right next to it, like the neighboring uh, uh, atom, that's going to be your neighbor. And if your neighbor has a hydrogen group on it, then that's really cool. Like for example, this CH2 has two neighbors, right? It has one, two, three sigma bonds away from all these hydrogens and it's one, to three sigma bonds away from this hydrogen. So this these hydrogens has two neighbors. This one only has one neighbor. This one only has one neighbor, right? So the splitting, so let's say for, 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 uh, for hydrogens A, is going to cause uh, your, your NMR to look like this, right? It's going to be splitting down like so. And what the splitting tells us, uh, so another way to depict it is to go to our example, is like right here, you see the splitting, like this is your resonance, and then you have all these splits, and in, in, in this uh, here, we have no splits. Why? Well, let's look at this, this example. And this uh, uh, H, like this green H over here, we have one sigma bond, two sigma bonds, and then three sigma bonds. And we don't reach any H's, which means that there's going to be no splitting. And this uh, hydrogen bond, is, there's some neighbors in there. In this hydrogen bond, we, uh, this, in this uh, resonance, we have some, uh, some uh, neighbors. And so we have some splitting, right? So that's what splitting is. Okay, so like, how do we how do we uh, work with splitting? Like, what do we do with it? Well, the n plus one rule is how we kind of use uh, uh, the information given to us by the splitting to determine how many hydrogens are are there and and to label these hydrogens, right? So let's say we have, <clears throat> uh, let's say for this molecule right here, we have. Uh, well, let me explain the the equation first before I get into it. But the equation is <laughs> is n plus one. The n equals neighbors, and the plus one is just there for the for the uh, for the nomenclature, right? So the n plus one rule: n is the neighbor is the number of neighboring hydrogens, right? So if you have no neighbors, so n equals zero. So zero plus one equals one. If you have one peak, you have a singlet. Basically, if you have a singlet, that means that you have no neighbors. If you have n equals n equals one, meaning you have one neighbor, then that means you have like, and when I mean neighbor. I don't mean like, okay, like these guys, this, like this one counts as a neighbor, this one counts as a neighbor, like each of these hydrogens count as a neighbor. Like, let's say, you know, for, for this here molecule, for, sorry, for this here hydrogens, right? Like these hydrogens, the neighbors are going to be this hydrogen and this hydrogen, like they both count as a type of neighbor. If we're looking at it from the perspective of hydrogens B, then this one would be a neighbor, this one would be a neighbor, this one would be a neighbor, and this one would be a neighbor, right? So we're just talking about neighboring hydrogens, not neighboring, um, what's it called, like groups. Like, like we're going to count these individually. They don't count as one. And remember, these uh, neighbors have to be non-equivalent, right? Okay, so uh, if you have n equals two, then that means uh, two plus one equals three. You have a triplet. If you have n equals three or three hydrogens are your neighbors, then you have n three plus one, which is four. And you have a quartet. Once you get to five and six, you can just call them either quintet or sixet, or they're just multiplets. Okay. So let's get the um, <clears throat> let's get the uh, NMR splitting of our excuse me our example molecule, right? So what would be the splitting for uh, hydrogens A? So let's see here. We have 
uh, one sigma bond, two sigma bond, three sigma bonds, we have uh, two hydrogens, right? And then there's nothing like we can't reach over here because there, there'd be too many sigma bonds away. So these, these HA hydrogens have two neighbors, right? So let's use the n plus one rule. Two plus one equals three. This is actually going to be a triplet. So whenever you have a triplet, that means that you have two neighboring hydrogens. If you have a doublet, you have one neighboring hydrogens. If you have a singlet, you have no neighboring hydrogens. Okay, so now let's think about it from the perspective. Now let's find out the splitting of uh, the hydrogen B hydrogens, right? So the hydrogen B hydrogens is one sigma bond, two sigma bonds, three sigma bonds. So all of these are neighbors of hydrogen B hydrogen and uh, one sigma bond, two sigma bonds, three sigma bonds. This hydrogen is also a non-equivalent neighbor uh, for the uh, B hydrogens, right? So they have to be uh, non-equivalent neighbors. We have one, two, three, four total uh, neighbors. Four plus one equals five. So we have a quintet, right? The, the split pattern is going to be a quintet split pattern. So, uh, so, the, so you would see on the, uh, on the NMR spec that um, these hydrogens here would have like uh, a, a quintet or, or, or just uh, like five peaks for its splitting pattern, right? Because whenever you split, um, like you would have a uh, specific either singlet, doublet, triplet, or quartet, quintet, sextet um, um, pattern, right? So let's say, let's find the uh, uh, splitting pattern of this here OH molecule. So let's say we have one sigma bond here, two sigma bonds, three sigma bonds here. We have two neighbors. These hydrogens are too far away. So you have two neighbors in total. They're not equivalent. Okay, so let's do the n plus one rule. So you're gonna have a triplet. Remember, triplet just means that you have two neighboring non-equivalent hydrogens. Okay, so enough of that. That's HNMR splitting. And just remember all of this stuff that we talked about with uh, with the HNMR. That's going to also be uh, true for the CNMR. Okay. The last thing that we're going to be talking about is called chemical shift, right? So chemical shift is just uh, a field. Like say we have a field like so. And the chemical shift is going to determine where you are in this field. And this field is going to be telling you whether your electron, uh, your, whether your, your compound is, or your, the hydrogen, sorry, is going to tell you whether the hydrogen that you're examining is de-shielded or shielded. Okay, so what does it mean to be de-shielded? It just means that the nucleus has, you know, it has a coat of electrons and the, the, the nucleus is positively charged and you know the positive charge is trying to like you know take in electrons, of course, because they're attracted. They're opposites. They attract. If you have D shielding, then you have the movement or pulling away of electrons from the nucleus. That you're going to have a D shielding effect. Okay. So what causes D shielding? Well, remember we're talking about pulling away of electrons. So if you have a polar or a highly electronegative group, then you're going to have D shielding. Okay. So which area, you know, the area over here or the area over here is associated with shielding? Well. The, uh, <clears throat> the downfield is the one that is associated with shielding. So if we were to like just draw an imaginary line like so, this would be the left side. And this would be the right side, AKA downfield. And this would be, uh, um, uh, uh, what's it called, upfield. So the way that I like to think about it, like I thought of this, uh, this analogy um, when I was like half asleep, I was like, what am I gonna tell my students? Like, oh man, um, the, what I thought was, so uh, carboxylic acid is like super, super duper ultra mega downfield. It's on the left side because it's highly polar. So I thought, okay, so carboxylic acid, and we're talking about downfield, I was like, okay, so I'm like, Imagine like you're a cop It's like, oh, that kid, yeah, he's going downtown for smoking that acid. So, <laughs> all right, so yes, yeah, so on the left side, you're going to have the highly, or on the left side, you're going to have the highly polar or, or, or highly electronegative uh, uh, um, uh, hydrogens. Remember the, the D shielding effect is going to be downfield. If you just think about carboxylic acid, all it's, like, it's gonna go downtown for smoking the carboxylic acid. It's just on the downfield side, the left side, right? This upfield side is going to be the right side. So it's like, oh man, this, this group is more uh, kind of upfield. Well, it's gonna be over here, right? Okay, so yeah, so chemical shift, it's really just determining, it's just telling you what the chemical environment is of your hydrogen 
So if your hydrogen, let's just say it's in a regular, just pentane, like this pentane molecule right here, well, then this hydrogen is most likely going to be in the right side of the field, aka the up field, right? There's nothing really de-shielding it. There's no polar groups. There is no electronegative atoms. And, but let's say we had a carboxylic acid, right? Attached to it instead. Like this carboxylic acid, man, this carbonyl is pulling a bunch of, uh, it's, it's highly polar. The OH group is also polar. So it's going to be on the left side, AKA downfield, right? So that's just, that's, so that's what um, these, uh, these, these, um, this, these chemical shifts tell you, right? And remember, when we're talking about chemical shifts, we're talking about the chemical environment of your hydrogens. If we're doing CNMR, then it'll be the chemical environment of your carbons. So when we're talking about like, oh, like it's, it's really deshielded, and we're talking about the left side for carboxylic acid, we're not talking about the whole molecule itself. We're talking about this hydrogen right here. Like this hydrogen right here is super getting deshielded. I mean, look at it. It's got bonded to an oxygen, and that oxygen is bonded to a carbonyl group. So that poor hydrogen like its electron is being basically stripped away from him. So it's going to be more on the left side. Let's say if it's just an alcohol group and we're examining the chemical environment for this hydrogen, okay, where is it going to land? Is the chemical environment, aka chemical shift of the hydrogen going to be on the left side, on the right side? Well, look at it. The, the, um, the oxygen is highly polar, right? It's going to be taking the electron density from the hydrogen. So you're going to expect it to be more towards... Uh, like going towards away from the pentane, like let's say pentane is like really just shielded. So this hydrogen, like, you know, a hydrogen on a pentane is shielded. The pentane itself, you know, it's got its own thing, but the hydrogen on itself, there's nothing really polar or electronegative pulling the electron density away. I mean, the carbon is more electronegative than the hydrogen, but it's not going to be that much to create like some sort of crazy dipole. So it's going to be shielded. This hydrogen is going to be okay. This hydrogen on the carboxylic acid, super deshielded. I mean, look at the poor thing. And the, the hydrogen on the alcohol group is going to be slightly deshielded as well because of that, uh, because of the uh, electronegativity of the oxygen group, right? Okay, so now let's officially look at our example. So <clears throat> here I have uh, some bits of information that you can just look through. Here I have at the bottom the, 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 the numbers associated with the CNMR. So uh, let's talk about the HNMR real quick first. So if you have a halogen, so let's say we have a, a, um, a halogen like so, let's say it's just X, you know, X denotes a halogen and we have a hydrogen over here. Well, then this hydrogen is going to be de-shielded by this electronegative um, uh, uh, halogen group, right? It's not going to be exactly stripping completely the electron, but it's going to be moving the electron. This, like this is a, a electron density cloud around this hydrogen this X or this halogen is going to be stripping it of it. It's going to be moving it more towards that, causing a de-shielding effect, right? So this is going to be uh, relying on the 3-4 on the, uh, chemical shift area. So over here, we have our, our, our uh, what's it called? Our chart. The, the X axis just tells you the, the chemical shifts, aka a parts per million. So the, the further your parts per million is, the more de-shielded you are, this number axis is just telling you your integration. So if we're talking about a, a regular uh, like uh, alkane group just doing its thing, it's going to be lower than if, uh, like let's say a hydrogen, it would be lower than if it, like uh, than the halogen group, right? Because in the halogen, they have some deshielding. This hydrogen here, there's no deshielding. So it's going to be less than three to four. Like you're most likely going to have like things, like you see over here, for this uh, uh, hydrogen here, this hydrogen in blue, you see how it's like even below two? It's because there's nothing really electronegative going on here. Like it's it's kind of close to an oxygen, but it's not even bonded to the oxygen. So it's like pretty decently far away from anything else. It's really, really upfield, AKA on the right side of the, of the, uh, of the spectra, right? If you have a halogen, however, you're gonna be mo more towards the three, four region over here. Like this spectrum doesn't go all the way up to 12. It can go up to 12. You're, if you have a halogen, it'd be over here. If you're like a hydrogen, like remember, we're talking about the chemical environments of the hydrogen. Okay, if you have an OH, you're going to be uh, expecting a resonance at the two to five region. Usually you find it at the four region at the double bond. If you guys remember coupling from uh, orgo, the thing was a nightmare. You're, you're going to be finding uh, resonances at the five, six region. So like over here, it's not shown. Uh, benzene, uh, it's going to be uh, higher than the double bond. You know, the benzene is just a, a ring and three double bonds, but like uh, it's going to be higher. It's going to be seven to eight. 
if you have an aldehyde, it'd be nine to 10 and the carboxylic acid is just the absolute worst, just deshielding it to the max, poor electron just being snatched away from its hydrogen group uh, all the way on the, the uh, left side, AKA downfield, right? Cause it's, it is, he's going downtown cause he's smoking that, that acid. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at, let's just really uh, quickly interpret this here graph. So let's say we're looking at this, this group right here, like these hydrogens. Well, what is these hydrogens? Like, what has it got going for it? Well, these hydrogens here, it's got, it's attached to a carbon. Okay. There's no neighboring. Cause like, let's say like we have one sigma bond here, one sigma bond, one sigma bond. That's three sigma bonds away. We have no neighbors. We have no splitting. It's attached to a carbon that is uh, attached, uh, that's double bonded to an oxygen group. Okay. Well, then it's a little bit upfield, like it's barely upfield. Well, that makes sense, right? Because it has, you know, some polarity um, from this oxygen, like that's causing D a little bit, right? Like, for example, let's look at the blue uh, hydrogens here, right? We have the blue hydrogens here. We have two neighbors, which means that, you know, the N plus one uh, uh, rule, the, the uh, two neighbors means that we're going to be having a triplet. As you can see here, we have one, two, three. That's going to be our triplet. And um, we have it on a really, really upfield, AKA on the right side. Why? Because let's look at the chemical environments of these hydrogens, right? It's bonded to a carbon and this carbon is bonded to an oxygen. So it's not even bonded to the oxygen itself. It's pretty far away, right? So there's gonna be pretty much upfield. There's not gonna be too much deshielding for this hydrogen. It's gonna be safe. Like its electrons are going to live for another day. However, let's look at the hydrogen group in red, right? So it has, uh, it has, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, four right here. It has a quartet, right? Cause it has three neighbors. It has one sigma bond, another sigma bond, another sigma bond. That's three sigma bonds and it has three hydrogens. So the splitting pattern, as you can see is, remember the N plus one rule. So three neighbors, three plus one is four. And then you're gonna have a, a, a four uh, 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 splitting pattern. You have a, a quartet, right? So you see the hydrogen here. This hydrogen is attached to an oxygen that oxygen is attached to a carbonyl group. Like that's insane. Like the, the de-shielding is going to occur. And as we mentioned before, if you have a, 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 um, a hydrogen that's close to an oxygen, you're gonna be finding it uh, in the two five region. In this case, we find it a little bit in the four region and it's gonna be up, it's gonna be, uh, sorry, it's gonna be downfield because it, uh, so, I mean, it's still kind of upfield, but it's gonna be more downfield from these other groups because it's actually bonded to something that's highly electronegative and even a carbonyl group. Okay, so these are just ranges that you have to remember for the H NMR. Here at the bottom of my notes, I have re uh, regions that you need to know for the C NMR. And that's basically all you need to know for H NMR. Like what they might ask you is like, they're, they're going to ask you, okay, like I say, we have this molecule here and they're going to ask you, okay, how many resonances would they have? So they're basically going to test your vocabulary. And like, how many resonances does this thing have? And then you're going to be like, oh, well, it has one, it has two, three, four, four different types of resonances. Or they might say, what's the splitting pattern? And they might label it A, B, C, and D. They're going to be like, okay, what's the splitting pattern of hydrogen and B? Well, let's say, okay, so it's got one single bond, two single bonds, three single bonds, um, one, two, three. There is, you know, you're too far away over here. You're also too far away over there, which means that it only is going to have this hydrogen over here as it's as its neighbor, right? One sigma bond, two sigma bonds, three sigma bonds. This is the only hydrogen that's the neighbor of this hydrogen. The N plus one rule, uh, one plus one equals two. It's a doublet, right? It's not a singlet. It's not by itself completely. It's a doublet. That's how they might ask you. So they might ask you about those things or they might even ask you, okay, where would this hydrogen be? And then point at a carboxylic acid. Well, if you, if you point at a carboxylic acid, that hydrogen is definitely going to be on the downfield area. So that's how you're gonna be presenting. I know in Oregon, you had to like actually construct the entire molecule, but remember in the MCAT, it's a mile wide, but an inch deep. So you're not going to have to do something as crazy as like creating a molecule from, your, from, a, uh, from a spectra. Like you might have to like recognize some things. Okay, like we're in the five to six region. We're going to be dealing with a double bond. We're in a seven to eight region. We're gonna be dealing with a benzene. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna be talking about is mass spectroscopy. All right, so basically mass spectroscopy is, is gonna be telling you you know, other things told you the conjugation, the, the, the type of bond identity in HNMR, we have the chemical environment of hydrogens that allows us to actually derive the chemical structure. What mass spectroscopy is gonna be telling you is the uh, mass of the compound or the molecular weight of your compound, which is pretty important because let's say you have the, um, 
you have the uh, <clears throat> let's say you have a product and you're not necessarily sure what the chemical formula of the product is, but you just know that there's some there's carbons, there are hydrogens, and there's oxygens. Well, if you can derive the mass of your product and you have the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens, then you can do some chemistry one stuff and like develop a ratio that makes sense for okay, like oh, like if you divide uh, this, like let's say you have a mass of 100. Oh, like if I find a ratio here, then I can find out that I have X amount of carbons, Y amount of hydrogens, and a Z amount of oxygens, right? So that's how you can use max spectroscopy. It's really just to figure out the molecular weight of a compound. Okay, so how does mass spectroscopy work? What is the mechanism? So for mass spectroscopy, what we're going to have is a, uh, is a sample, and that sample is going to be floating around doing its thing is going to be shot in the it's going to be shot with electrons to the point where it's going to gain a charge. So how does that happen? So we have a compound here. It's doing its thing. We're going to have an electron gun. Like it's it's kind of funny for me to think about just like someone holding a microscopic electron gun just shooting something. So electron just boom bada bing and it's going to pop off an electron from the compound causing your compound to have a positive charge, right? Because electrons repel so electron is going to be shot at such a high speed that it's just going to pluck off another electron, kind of like bouncing it like billiard balls on the uh, on the on the uh, billiard table. You're just like uh, you know, you're just poking it, and then it's going to like snap, and the electron is going to fly off, and you're going to have a positive charge on your um, on your compound. Well, then this compound is flown into a contraption that has a magnetic field. And then it's going to fly through a wee, and then the magnetic field based on the mass of your compound is going to like cause it to curve. So if it's a really massive compound, then it's not going to curve a lot, right? Like the, the way uh, the magnetic field is not going to affect it as much because there's a lot of mass. But if there's a, not a lot of mass, well, that thing is going to be bent, like, oh, shit. That thing is going to be bending, bending. It's going to be like this, right? So it really just depends on the mass, like how much bending you have from the mass spectroscopy. So they might ask you like, hey, like which of these two molecules is going to like be hit at a further away distance? Well, it'd be the molecule that has the lowest molecular weight. Why? Because it's going to be bending more, right? Okay, so that's the mechanism of mass spectroscopy. Okay, so like how can we derive actual information from it? Okay, so <clears throat> we would have here, Let's say, this looks really like uh, low budgeted, <laughs> but this is, let's say like your mass spec. Here on the Y axis, you have something called abundance. So the abundance just tells you like how much of this particular molecular weight you had in your sample. Like uh, you had this much of a, of a molecular weight that had a 99. Uh, so it, it measures it in AMU, I forgot to put that there, AMU, atomic mass units. And then you're just going to have to convert that to grams eventually. Um, you have like uh, you have a bunch of you know have like a medium sized amount of 99 uh, of of this compound that had a molecular weight of 99, one that had a molecular weight of 113, one that had a molecular weight of 128, and then one that had a molecular weight of 129. Right. So that's what uh, your your mass spec is going to look like. Here at the bottom on the x axis, you have mass over charge. So typically, when we just shoot something with an electron, you're just going to take off you know one electron. You're going to bounce it off. And so your, your E is usually just plus one and anything divided by one is just itself. So usually your, uh, your what's it called? Your, your X axis just tells you the molecular weight, right? You just don't have to do anything. But let's say, for example, if they tell you that E, like usually they say either E or Z. So it can be an M over E or it can be M over Z. It just depends which graph they tell you. So if you have an E or Z equals plus two, well, then you're going to, to like whatever numbers they give you here, you're going to have to multiply that thing by two in order to account for the fact that you're dividing everything by two, right? Okay, so, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, what does this necessarily tell us? Well, let's say this is the mass spec of n nonane, right? So remember we talked about how n was normal. So like, okay, like now you don't have to like uh, uh, figure out what kind of um, thing it looks like. We just can draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that would be none name. I don't trust myself. I'm counting again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I pfft. look at that. Nice, dude. You learn from experience. One, two, three, four. Oh, I got to suck at counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You have none name here. If you you know figure out the molecular weight, like you add all the carbons involved, you add all the hydrogens involved, 
you know, of course you can have nine hydrogens. I think it's nine times two is uh, 18. 18 plus two is gonna be uh, 20. So you're actually gonna have 20 hydrogens. Like this will be, and then uh, I think carbon has like a molecular weight of 12 or something and then hydrogen has one, but like, okay, that's whatever. That's besides the point. Anyways, the molecular weight of uh, nonane is 128. Like that's the actual like molecular weight. So like what's with all this other stuff? Like if nonane was our sample, then why, like what's with 99 and 113 and one, like 129, what's all that about? So mass spec is not only going to tell you molecular weight, but it's also going to tell you of isotopes, right? So remember an isotope, um, what it is, is like your element, but it has more neutrons on it, making it heavier or lighter. So like, let's say, you know, protons, oops, not, protons tells you uh, exactly what your element is. Like that's the kind of like the fingerprint of your element. Like if you have a specific number of protons, then okay, like if you have one proton, okay, you're a hydrogen, right? And then, and then you have two, prot uh, pro two protons, you have uh, helium, right? So it just gives you the identity of the neutrons. However, it just gives weight. So let's say you uh, uh, have hydrogen here, the isotope of hydrogen, let's say you uh, have hydrogen here, uh, deuterium is just one additional neutron. Tritium is two additional neutrons. So those are isotopes of hydrogen. So we can also have hydrogen of carbon. You have isotopes of bromine, hydrogen, hydrogen um, sorry, isotopes of chlorine, isotopes of bromine. So there's just isotopes for everything. Um, however, some isotopes, excuse me, some isotopes are more abundant in nature than others, right? Like C13 and C12, like those are, are, are what's it called? Isotopes of each other, but we're most likely going to be working with the more stable isotope of, of like whatever it, is, whatever it is that you're working with, right? So let's look at um, uh, uh, some, some isotopes that we're gonna be working with. So for example, we have uh, bromine. So bromine naturally occurs in two isotopes in equal abundance, right? So we have uh, 79 and then we have 81. Like those are just a difference of three, like uh, 79, uh, 80, 81. <laughs> Oh my God, that's how you know I'm tired. It's not a difference of three, it's a difference of two. Come on. <sighs> Sorry, your you're, you're, uh, guy is just tired, man. All right, so that's a, that's a difference of two. <clears throat> and uh, that just means that uh, you have uh, the bromine, you have your, your, your uh, two additional neutrons, right? That's what it means, the, the weight is different. Uh, and what's crazy is that, uh, oh, did I spell isotope wrong? Yep. So what's crazy is that um, you have, you know, you have these in actual like equal amounts in nature. Usually you have one isotope that's preferred over the other. Like you're gonna be a lot, you're gonna be finding a lot more of hydrogens that you're gonna be finding deuteriums, right? So for BR, like 78 and 81, they're occurring in the, in the same uh, equivalence, which means that if, if you have a bromine in a molecule, let's say like we're looking at this molecule right here, what's crazy about the, what, what's crazy about what you're gonna see on the mass spec is that you're going to see a, 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 a signal like this and you're going to be finding an equivalent signal two atomic mass units away. So remember atomic mass unit is just for, uh, for, for, uh, for weight. You're gonna be finding another signal with the equal size two mass units away. Why? Because bromine comes in two equivalent, um, uh, it comes in an equal uh, natural abundance of 79 and 81. So what that, okay, let me just remove this here. So what that means, and let me zoom in. So what that means is that like, let's say you had a, a compound and it came out to be X, uh, what's it called? An X uh, molecular weight. Well, because uh, bromine can either be 79 or 81. Like let's say this, this is the 79 one. Well, this wouldn't be the 81 one, right? So it just has, it's just two AMU away. And this is just like X plus two, right? Because uh, uh, bromine comes in two natural ones. Okay, what's another example? So chlorine, so these are just relevant. They, they're the most likely, uh, the, mo the most high yield uh, uh, kind of isotopic relationships you're going to find in, in mass spec. It's gonna be bromine and chlorine. So for chlorine, on the other hand, uh, it's not, so you, <coughs> you have two, <coughs> sorry, I'm <coughs> starting to lose my voice. I've been talking all day. If you have uh, two, um, let's say you have two isotopes, however, they're not an equivalent abundance, right? And bromine, 79 and 81, they're just, you know, they're both you know, found at the same kind of uh, 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 way, the same natural abundance. Like they're, if you have a handful of bromine, half of them are going to be 79, half of them are going to be 81. However, in chlorine, 
you're going to grab a handful, there's going to be 75% of them is going to have 35 and 25% of them is actually going to be 37, right? So if we have a peak, however, it's, it's still, it's still like it's derivable, right? Like say it's peak at 35, there's peak at 37, we're going to say x plus 35 because like the whole molecular structure is not going to be 35 AMU. Yeah, x plus 37, we're same thing, x plus 79, x plus uh, 81. That's just to take into account that the molecule is going to have its own molecular weight. And we're just like uh, using the 79, 81, 35, 37. It's just a reference. Well, this peak, let's say it's this big. We know characteristically if we have another peak that's kind of 25% big from compared to this peak, then uh, like, like, let's say this peak is like this big, uh, let's say three, then because the isotope 37 is 25% in abundance, we're actually going to be finding it a third about as big, like this size right here, right? So if you have a characteristic, okay, you have two major peaks at the same like abundance, like the same line, then, and, and they're only two AMU away, okay, you're going to have some bromine in there. If you have two, if you have a, a, a mass spec that's two AMU away, but you have like this characteristically big one, and then you have like one that's exactly a third the size, then okay, you know that there's gonna be some chlorine in there. Okay, I think that basically wraps up what you need to know for mass spec. I guess the last thing that you really need to know is like this 99 and 113. So what does those mean? Basically, when you're shooting your sample with the electrons, man, those electrons are gonna hurt. They can actually break apart your nunnane. So 99 and 113 are really just fragments, like incomplete fragments of nunnane. So let's say you, you had your nunnane here and you broke it off at the, uh, at the uh, right here, right? So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait, was this whole thing 10? Oh my God, no way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No. <laughs> oh God, I, I triple checked. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's hilarious. And I'm sure some of you were like, dude, is he going to catch it? Okay, he finally did. Wow. Hopefully there's just like two people watch this. If two people watch this, I'd be content. All right. One, two, three, four. I'm doing this bit by bit, homie, because I'm super tired. I can't, I, I can't draw nothing for my life. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's a seven one here. Eight, nine. Okay. Is this one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. I'm not gonna waste your time and count it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna count it again. I, I'm really not. Okay, I'm confident. All right. <clears throat> so let's say we have this, and we break it off with two carbons remaining. So there should be seven here. Let me just count right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perfect. Uh, if we have seven here, that means that you know these two carbons were plopped off. Then you're going to have the ninety-nine. Uh, 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 abundance, right? So that means like, you know, if you count these like this, this, this heptane, I guess, is going to have a molecular weight of 99. However, if you're bombarding it with electrons and you happen to break it rather than breaking two carbons off and you just break one carbon off, like let's say this is the carbon that's missing, then you're going to only have 113 going to be as your mass spec, right? So some of the pieces of your, of your, of your complex is going to be split off because the electron gun is like hella strong, but okay. I have all of this explained in the slides, guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I know I went through this pretty fast. I'm not sure uh, how much time I've been just sitting down, maybe an hour 30, maybe an hour, I'm not really sure. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And I'm going to be posting another video tomorrow uh, dealing with the, the, the uh, lab techniques for the biochemistry portion. And then the day after that, I'm going to be releasing chapter seven for Orgo. Um, and then we'll hit the ground running tomorrow. I mean, we're gonna hit the ground running on Monday with chapter six, finishing up or our organic chemistry. The whole book is going to be covered. Okay, I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll be seeing you on Monday.